The gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13 and 18 through 26. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the, at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting, sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, If only I touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, for your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout the district. May God's understanding be on those who hear his words. I need a prayer today. I really need a prayer today. Who's going to pray for the preacher? Anybody? Here comes Alexa. Thank you, sweet thing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being here, for bringing us together, for bringing Terry to us, to guide us, to open our ears and our minds and our hearts to your love and your wisdom. Send your spirit on her and fill her and her mouth that she may pass on your wisdom to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I've often said that no one ever hears or reads scripture in a vacuum because you have to take it in its context. Professor Dick Murray, the late Professor Dick Murray from Perkins School of Theology, which is the United Methodist Seminary that's part of Southern Methodist University, he was one of the foundational writers of the Disciple Bible Study. How many of you took the Disciple Bible Study? They're going to renew that one. It's a great thing. But he always said, we cannot know what it means to us now until we know what it meant to them then. Which means you can't just say today's reading is what all I need to understand scripture. But also, you read scripture in different ways at different times of your life, right? How many of you read the story of Mary's um, expected baby when you were pregnant for the first time and you had this wonderful feeling of the baby leaping in you or when she went to see her cousin Elizabeth. How many of you heard the story of the Jesus resurrection in a different way the first time you listened to it after your spouse or your parent died? There are different ways you hear scripture and I heard it very clearly this week because I was at annual conference. Not where you expect to hear the word of God sometimes, although there's powerful preaching. There was a fight on the floor of conference, not a fist fight, but it threatened to get physical. When one person said, I could punch him in the face and I have a black belt in karate, someone else jumped up and said, point of information, bishop, bishop, she threatened him with bodily harm. She must be censured, bishop. Bishop, I may bring charges against her myself, meaning to charge a clergy with a chargeable offense to take away their ordination. It was not a pretty thing. Now I have some thanks I need to give to people from annual conference this year. Beth was my roommate who helped me get stuff into my room. 
Jackie helped me get out of my room because I couldn't open the door. It was so heavy. I get my walker, my wheelie thing, my rollator here through, and my luggage. So I had to call. I called like three people. I was like, could you help me get out of my room, please? Jackie answered the call. Then Lambert picked me up from conference. I laid hands on my surrogate son, Sam, and helped ordain him this year. Then I went down the ramp straight out the door and took my robe off on the sidewalk and got in the car in Lambert, and I went to my neighbor's wedding. My neighbor had asked me to do part of his wedding, and I didn't get there in time to do that, but um, we got there in time for the party. I left at the party. Because you would think that, you know, 1300 United Methodist under one roof would be a party, right? <laughs> you think, maybe, maybe, maybe. And my neighbor's wedding was not a Christian ceremony because it was done by the singer Edwin McCain. Some of you may remember him from the 90s. And if you saw the podcast that I did with Kelly and Edwin back a couple years ago, you'll remember him from that. But he did the wedding because anyone in Maryland, you just get a piece of paper that says you're legal and they'll let you do a wedding. He did the wedding without God, I'm guessing. I don't know if they had it or not. And the party was not exactly a Christian party because they actually had a margarita bar open before the wedding. And they had an open bar after the wedding and during the wedding. And some people didn't even go to the wedding. It looked like they were over by the bar the whole time. And there was a lot of music because Kelly's a professional musician. He sang here almost a year ago for Juneteenth last year on Father's Day. But I started to think about the story when I read the lesson because I will tell you, I didn't look at the lessons for this week until Monday. I always read ahead in the lectionary. But everything was so busy with my mom's funeral and conference that I didn't even look at it until Monday. And I read it and I thought, wow, God spoke to me because this is the passage God has used to speak to me before the calling of Matthew, the tax collector. Because he calls Jesus, Jesus calls Matthew, he knows my name, Matthew, come on, follow me. And Matthew goes and follows him, and Matthew immediately throws the dinner. Not a good Jewish gathering, because he's a tax collector. What does that mean? He cheated his own people. He colluded with Rome. He was looked down upon. Nobody liked a tax collector. It wasn't like an IRS agent. How many of you have ever gotten a notice saying you're going to be audited and you pass that on the floor? Not like that kind of tax collector, but hated because he cheated his own people all the time. And he said a tax collector's booth was like a toll booth. You passed by, you got stopped. Imagine being a fisherman in the first century, relying on that little bit of income you have from catching fish. Whether you caught a few or whether you caught a lot, you'd have to stop and pay taxes. And here's Matthew, and Jesus wants him to follow, and he follows, and then he has a party, and everybody goes to the party. And I thought, which party would Jesus rather be at? Annual conference or the wedding reception with all the margaritas? Jesus would rather have been at the one with the margaritas, I'm telling you, because people there were happy to be together. They were there for that couple. Nobody was drunk and disorderly, but they were in a joyful place. Conference was not joyful, was it, Jackie? Except for ordination. Except for ordination. Ordination was joyful. The rest of it was just sort of like, wow. So, here we are. Let me go back to Hosea for a minute first. How many of you know anything about the prophet Hosea? Weirdest book in the Bible, I think, in a lot of ways, because Hosea is an Old Testament prophet, lived about 800 years before the birth of Christ, and he is sort of an allegory for God and Israel, because God picked out Hosea's wife. Guess what she did for a living? Anybody remember what she did for a living? She was a prostitute. God knew she was a prostitute, and in fact, even after they get married, she's still not faithful to her husband, Hosea. Their third child's name literally translates to not my people. Imagine, you know, this is my kid, not my people, not mine, belonging to somebody who had visited his wife. And Hosea wants to divorce her because his heart's broken. And he goes to God and says, I've got to get rid of this woman. And God says, no, this is who I want for you. I want you to go back and love her all the harder. I want you to go back and be her husband. I want you to go back and be faithful to her because this is how Israel is with me. And I am so tempted to tell them to hit the road, but I can't do it because I love them too deeply. Hosea's book is written mostly as poetry, and this was poetry here today. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? We're talking about the northern kingdom this time. 
the Assyrians are about to come and overtake them, and that's the second exile after the Babylonian exile of the southern kingdom. But the God who tears down is the God who always redeems, and God promises them redemption. And this is a book that talks about the one who's going to follow, who's going to sit on David's throne, David's descendant, the one we know as Jesus the Christ, is going to come and redeem them. But until that happens, we have what happens in Matthew's Gospel. Now, I said this speaks to me, and this is Matthew quoting Hosea, because what did Hosea at the end of the passage says? For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Jesus has dinner with a bunch of sinners, which is what he does every time we have communion. He has dinner with a bunch of sinners, right? Amen? Are we not sinners ourselves here? And he has dinner with them, and the Pharisees, the good people, the holy people, the ones who live by the book, exactly by the book, say, why is he eating with these sinners? And Jesus heard this and says, those who have no need of a physician, who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So what is this speaking to me about? 1981 was my first year at annual conference. I was a newly minted college graduate. I went as the lay representative to annual conference from the Texas Charge. Why? I was also the SPRC chair of the Texas Charge when I was 22 years old. Why? Because nobody else wanted to do it anymore. They're like, oh, Terry will do it. She'll do anything. She's all excited about Jesus. I went to annual conference that year, and that was the first year they introduced the legislation against homosexual people in the United Methodist Church, and I voted my assent to that language because that's what I had grown up learning my whole life, that homosexuals were wrong and that they needed to be out of the church in terms of leadership. I spent the last 40 years regretting that decision because of this passage here. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Mercy, love, not hate. Mercy, the grace of God not law. That's what we're talking about when we get to Romans. It's not by law that we're saved. We're saved by grace. I never addressed this from the pulpit before. Most people know where I stand on the issue. I never addressed it from the pulpit before, but God's talking to me really loudly this week because people have left the church not just because we may change and accept homosexuals in our congregations as pastors or we may agree to do gay weddings at some time in the future. That's why our church is going to split next year. It's going to split. We voted on 23 congregations that disaffiliated with the United Methodist Church this year alone because of this issue, and 36 more are suing the annual conference because of the trust clause. It's a tough issue, I know, and I'm not asking anybody to agree with me on this. I want you to know where I stand because it is about grace and mercy and not about the law. People have left because of this, but people are leaving on the other side as well. And we may lose some more people from this congregation because of our discriminatory practices against people who are gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender. Jesus did not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners. Now, when people say to me, Go and sin no more. I say one time Jesus said that to one person that he healed and helped in scripture. One time only did he say that. But here we have an opportunity to minister to lots of people. When I looked at that wedding reception, I thought about all those people who are friendly and they're having a good time and loving one another and being joyful. I thought, how many of them have been excluded from church because of who they are, their tattoos? There were so many tattoos there, I felt naked. You agree, Lambert? Did you see anybody without a tattoo other than me and you? And the, the bride? <laughs> that was it. But those people are hungry for what we have in abundance. We don't like to share with people we don't know and don't like who are different from us, do we? There were people there of every race you could imagine, every faith tradition you could imagine, faith, no tradition that you could imagine. People spoke from their heart about how this couple had touched their lives. And, and her father did pray before the meal, and 
prayed in Jesus' name. But how many people are there in the world who don't know the love of God and the Savior and they don't come to church because of our attitudes? Let me tell you about Mrs. Iris Hull, who was a member of our last congregation. Iris died last year and went to be with Jesus at 96 years old. She and I talked about this at length, and she said, you know, I think you're wrong. I think it's a sin. But she said, my sin is judging other people. So I've judged people and kept them from coming to church, to come to Christ. She said, that's not any better than what anybody else does. And God sent the gay men to live across the street from Iris. They brought the florist shop across the street, gay florists, go figure. Iris showed up on Easter Sunday with the most beautiful rose, roses, little yellow roses corsage that I've ever seen. I said, I know your husband didn't buy that for you. She said, oh, heck no. I said, Vicki, her daughter, she said, no. The gay men across the street brought those flowers to me. I said, you're wearing homosexual flowers in this church, Iris? I said, get out of here, girl. She laughed and said, oh, she said, they're such good men. They love me so much. They love my husband so much. When it snows, they shovel our driveway. They never go to the store without bringing us a pie or some buns or something that my husband just loves. Bill had a sweet tooth, all right. Then on Mother's Day, I looked at her. She didn't have a corsage, and I said, where are your gay flowers, Iris? She said, oh, they're on my coat. And again, a beautiful corsage from them. She said, you know, I'd love to invite them to church, but I don't think my family would treat them very well. If we all got that far, we live in a different world, but we have to take sides and beat each other up. When I was going into the ministry, when I told people I was called, I didn't believe I was called. I told you before, I spent three years trying to talk myself out of my call. Trying to talk myself out of my call. Because women shouldn't do that. That's what I heard my whole life. Women aren't supposed to serve Jesus. Not as a pastor, I heard, honey, God didn't call you to be a pastor. God called you to marry a pastor. I thought, no, God did not call me to marry a pastor. God called me to be a pastor. Because I went to ordination, I heard those words. Are you called to the life and work of an elder in Christ church? And I said, yes, 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 yes. And there was that year when conference was held at the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in D.C., the big Catholic church by Catholic University. We had ordination there. If you've ever been in that congregation, they have a more than life-size crucifix that leans out over the congregation. And Bishop Fred Wirtz said, anyone, any men or women, I thought, women, women, who are called to the life and work of an elder, come forward. I didn't know what happened to me. I was up and I was moving, and the woman next to me grabbed my skirt and tried to pull me back. I said, where do you think you're going, Terry? Get back here, get back here. And I went, because that's all I could do. I could not say no to Jesus Christ looking at me from that cross, saying, you I want, I want you. And a friend of mine named Gregory Wise, I told him, I don't know what to do, and he said, you have to ask yourself this, is God calling you or somebody else's idea of who you're supposed to be? I realized when Jesus looked at me from that cross and said, Terry, come. Terry, follow me. He was talking to me. And I got up and I went. And my life has never been the same because of that. And I went home and I told my parents. My mother cried. She said, people aren't nice to pastors. People are mean to pastors. Amen to that. There are people who are really mean to pastors. Not you all, but other people. Right? Other people. No, this church has been very loving and accepting of me. I'm not your first woman, but I was the first woman most places I served. And I had people get up and throw hymnals on the floor and stomp out when I preached. My friend Greg, who said, is God calling you or someone else's idea of who you should be? He's the one that was the Terry to Sam in my life. He put his hand on me at my ordination, and he surrendered his orders because he's a homosexual. Two years ago, he took his own life. Jesus said to them, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. What did Jesus do after he left the party? But he went to the home of a leader who said, my daughter died. You need to come. She's dead. What was touching a dead body in the law of Israel? You're not supposed to do that. Uh Uh-uh, you're unclean if you touch a dead body. You cannot touch a dead body. Remember the story of the good Samaritan on the road because the priest walks by because the person might be dead? Look like he was dead? touches the dead body, and then the woman touches him who had a hemorrhage for 18 years. Ladies, you know what we're talking about here, right? You can imagine a menstrual cycle lasting for 18 years. He 
would be anemic, you would be stooped over, you would be sick, and you would be unclean. You would not be able to live in your home with your family. And she touches Jesus, and he doesn't say, get away from me, you're unclean, you're dirty, you're filthy, you're, you're going to condemn me, you're going to put me in a bad way with the synagogue. No, Jesus says, your faith has made you well, because her faith said, I've got to get to Christ. I've got to get there, I've got to touch him, if I touch him. So what I want you to do today, not agree with me on everything. We don't have to agree to be in love with one another, do we? We don't have to agree on every item of doctrine or practice in the church. I want you to ask yourself if you are against the inclusion of homosexual people or LGBTQ plus people in the church, ask yourself why. Is it because of the law of God or is it because it's just personally repugnant to you? And if you're offended by homosexual behavior, I want you to just be as equally offended by guns in schools, children living in poverty, people starving in our own neighborhoods. Because if those things are offensive to you, that's a good thing too. I hope you can understand why I needed to share this with you today. Because I don't want to see the United Methodist Church become the untied United Methodist Church. You know, that's the big typo you always get in seminary, and it's a real word, so spell check doesn't pick it up. The untied Methodist church, we're kind of an unglued Methodist church, where we can stand and scream at each other on the floor of annual conference and threaten each other with all sorts of things. Or we can be like the people at the party, where they're out of love for the people getting married in joy and peace and wonderment. That's where I want to be serving. I want to serve where people are hungry for righteousness. I want to be with Abraham, who said yes to God. God said, Abraham, follow me. God said, Matthew, follow me. You know who Matthew taxed every day? Fishermen. Can you imagine Peter and James and John and Andrew? They're all on top of the world because this man, Jesus, has called them, and here they are, and then Jesus calls him. Him? Why would he call him? Why would he call me? Why would he call your name? Because he knows your name, he knows your every thought. He sees every tear that falls, and he'll hear you when you call. I'm telling you the truth. God will call you and just say, yes, Lord, and get up and follow. Amen, amen, amen.